Hello and welcome to Unheard. I'm Freddie Sayers. The question of excess deaths has been one that we've been grappling with. It's become as controversial, at least, as some of the COVID controversies. The camps have already formed, the herds, as to what the correct explanation for why more people are dying than we would expect each week. On the one hand, you've got people who are absolutely insistent that it is connected to the vaccine in some way, and some of them will not rest until they prove that case. On the other hand, you have more establishment voices who are absolutely insistent that it has absolutely nothing to do with the vaccine and is much more likely to do with COVID itself or some hospital effects or all sorts of other factors. And so once again, a question that should be a scientific question that is incredibly important to all of us has become something of a culture war. Today, we are going to try and pick through this difficult question, and to help us do that, we have uh, someone who really should have no axe to grind. His name is Stuart MacDonald. He is Head of Demographic Assumptions and Methodology for Lloyd's Banking Group, and he is a Fellow of the Institute of Actuaries and a Chartered Enterprise Risk Actuary. In other words, he makes it his professional business every day to look at the numbers of how people are dying and how many and what that means for society at large. So welcome, Stuart. Thank you. Good to be here. Do you recognise, first of all, what I said in that intro, that already some of that culture war atmosphere has kind of attached itself to this question of excess deaths? Uh, I do, yes. I, I think it is uh, an unfortunate phenomenon of uh, the pandemic more generally. Uh, that uh, we are uh, seeming to make decisions uh, often before the data is available. Um, it's, uh, you know, it, it is an unfortunate thing. As you say, uh, I, I don't have a particular axe to grind. This is something that the actuarial profession has been investigating since way before the pandemic. In fact, you'd have to go back to the, the last pandemic of 1918-19, uh, which is around when this continuous mortality investigation uh, began. So. Um, yeah, I, I do recognise your comments. Uh, I hope to give an unbiased view on the situation as I see it. Let's talk about the actual numbers then. And let's just go through them quite methodically so that our audience, wherever they sit on this spectrum, will know that we're trying to actually get to the bottom of this. So first of all, are more people than you would expect dying every week in the UK? And what extent is that? We've got a, a chart that you've put on Twitter, I think it's shared from the Office of National Statistics, that depicts the amount of deaths each week and how that differs from the five-year average. So that uh, information from the Office for National Statistics is a great place to start. So what they're doing there is comparing the number of deaths that have been observed with the uh, number of deaths uh, that took place in the same week um, over a recent five-year period. Um, now, there's different baselines, benchmarks, if you like, that can be used for that five-year period. But um, what, what they're doing is, is a reasonable starting point. Uh, you can see on that chart the really huge spikes in deaths which occurred uh, in the first and, and second waves of the pandemic. Um, but what I'd like to do, if, if we can, is, is focus in on the last 10 weeks or so. Um, so it's around... Um, it's a, around three or four months now since we start, started to see this phenomenon of uh, excess deaths happening each week in the UK. Uh, the earlier period around Easter and May is, is slightly distorted by the bank holidays that were happening. So this chart is of, of death registrations uh, rather than the actual date that they occur. So it gets, it gets messed up around bank holidays. So you get a good clean period if we focus on the last 10 weeks. Just before we uh, look at that, can I just look at there's a previous period, um, weeks one to eight, 2022, where there seemed to be quite a lot of deaths involving COVID, but the total number of deaths is still less than the five-year average. What's that about? Yeah, so that, that was the, the story going into, um, into 2022. Uh, so the important thing to understand, and it, it plays to the recent period as well, is that unlike at the early stages of the pandemic, this variation in excess deaths, which we're seeing, and as a reminder, excess deaths is the difference between what we're actually observing and, and what we might have expected. It's actually about 
the actual number of deaths that we're seeing each week staying relatively flat, but the number we expect moving up and down with the seasons. So if we look at the winter just gone, uh, the first Omicron wave that we experienced in January was actually no worse than a, a typical flu season in terms of the immediate mortality that it produced. So deaths were high, they were a little higher than they are now, but they were no higher than we would normally see in January, February period. Well, they were less, so they were I, less high. Indeed, yeah. So the, so the Omicron wave was net a sort of negative wave. It produced less mortality than we might have expected in a, at that winter. Yes, yeah, so flu was suppressed uh, over the winter. Omicron impact, you can see those uh, COVID deaths uh, that have occurred, but the impact of Omicron was less than uh, a typical flu season. And, uh, and therefore, we, we saw negative excess deaths on this um, Office for National Statistics basis in, in the first couple of months of 2022. Okay, so take us to current day then. So the last 10 weeks, pretty consistently, we're seeing, what is it? 15%, 18% more deaths per week than we would expect? There are thereabouts, yes. Uh, it's fluctuating. It was a little higher in the heatwave weeks, uh, but generally uh, around 15% uh, excess. We've, we've seen 15,000 excess deaths um, on that ONS basis. So 15,000 more deaths than the average over the last 10 weeks. Right. So, so we can say one thing then with certainty. There, there is no conspiracy attached to this. And pretty much everyone, whether they are more establishment or anti-establishment, will agree that more people are dying than we would normally expect. It's an undeniable fact. Second thing that we know for certain is that those deaths are disproportionately attached to some conditions. Is, is that right? You, you tweeted a table showing the excess percentage attached to different conditions. Let's get that up and have a look at it. So talk us through this. At the top of the list looks like heart failure at 24% excess. So this table that we're looking at, it shows you uh, a selected, so 10 of the biggest uh, causes uh, of death that we normally see. And this is any mention of that cause on the death certificate. So for example, um, this table is showing us that there were 13,155 uh, deaths uh, over that period where heart failure was mentioned on the death certificate. Uh, multiple causes of death get mentioned on death certificates. So, um, uh, it, you know, it, it won't necessarily be the only one and you can't add up the numbers that are in this table. I mean, I guess you would observe also that the number two um, on the list, the ischemic heart diseases seems kind of within the same family as, as heart failure, I guess. Ischemic means deprived of oxygen, doesn't it? So that, I guess certain types of heart failure would be described. Uh, yes, indeed. They're, they're, both, um, they're both related cardiovascular conditions. And the majority of the cases where we are seeing an excess are cardiovascular, circulatory, cerebrovascular. So you would group most of these um, conditions together uh, to some extent. And uh, yes, they are, they are all elevated. We're seeing um, consid considerable excess deaths. Um, one thing I've tried to do here, as I mentioned, there are multiple causes uh, mentioned on the condition, uh, on the death certificates. So I've highlighted uh, where the opinion of the physician uh, certifying the death certificate was that the underlying cause was COVID. So if we consider the heart failure or the um, ischemic heart diseases, for example, only a very small proportion of those uh, had COVID as the underlying cause. Uh, if we look at the chronic lower respiratory diseases or the acute respiratory infections, again, those had high excesses, but actually the vast majority of the excess deaths that were seen in those two causes were actually attributable to COVID. So Stop me if I'm just kind of freewheeling here, Stuart, but there are some other things we can deduce quite confidently from that table. Obviously, at the bottom of the list there is cancer. One of the things we were all worried about during lockdowns was that delayed cancer diagnoses would lead to a big delayed spike in cancer death. That doesn't seem to have happened so far, or at least that's not borne out by this. So that's one, one of the causes we can pretty much cross off. Is that fair? I think the important, I would agree with everything you've said, and, and uh, the important uh, part of what you said was so far. Um, uh, so 
those fears about uh, cancer deaths, I think, were legitimate. Um, the disruption that the health service uh, experienced, caused primarily by the pandemic, but also, of course, uh, by uh, the actions that we took in response to the pandemic, um, that disruption has had an impact on cancer. It has meant missed and delayed diagnoses, and that will mean uh, a worse prognosis and, and shorter life expectancies for cancer patients whose cancers get detected at a later stage. Uh, but I think that will play out over a much longer time period. Uh, you, you might be talking about somebody who would, would otherwise have had a 10 year life expectancy instead having five. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a doctor, I'm using those numbers uh, illustratively, but I don't think we are yet seeing um, uh, cancer delays uh, playing a material uh, part in the excess that we're seeing. I think other conditions like cardiovascular, those delayed diagnoses might be playing out to a greater extent at, at this stage. The effect of the rest of the table then is also really interesting because what it shows is clearly heart-related conditions are more elevated than other conditions. So for those people who think it's something specific that is causing heart condition, and there are, I know people who think that could be a COVID after effect or it could be a vaccine after effect and people have different views on that, they would take quite a lot of energy from this table because it looks like it's at the top of the table. But on the other hand, there's also a generally elevated death, even from all sorts of things that aren't connected. So that seems to imply that there's something else going on as well. Do you think that we can sort of deduce quite confidently that there's more than one factor at play by looking at this table? We can, I think it's difficult to uh, be concrete from that table. The, 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 te the table is telling us what, it's not telling us why. And uh, more work will be needed uh, to develop uh, better data um, that allows us to be a little bit more granular uh, that is going to help us start to answer those questions why. But I would support what you said about multiple causes. Um, some of the, the things you said, uh, you know, people that have got an axe to grind um, that uh, it's the vaccine, which I would firmly disagree with personally, or that it's a, a, a post-COVID infection, which I, I do think is more uh, plausible, and we can come on to, to why I have those views, but they are they are opinions. Uh, most of what I've been discussing with you today are facts. Um, the um, well, should other we just, thing that should we dive into that, Stuart? I mean, no time like the present. Then clearly, that's a, the most kind of controversial of these ideas. But let's talk about it. Why? So so there we have a, a strong indication that cardiovascular deaths are elevated in particular, that we know from the vaccine, or at least from the mRNA vaccines, that there were myocarditis and pericarditis, which were heart-related conditions, are formally accepted side effects of, of the vaccine. It's literally listed on the packet, so I don't think that's controversial to say, but that's not the same as heart failure, and it shouldn't lead to deaths in very many numbers. Meanwhile, there's a, there are studies, I read one in Nature magazine, that point to COVID itself, or at least in, in intense cases that led to hospitalization, also leading to heart injury and failure further down the line. So there is a, there's kind of, there's evidence on both sides there. Why have you come to such a firm conclusion? Uh, so I, uh, I want to reiterate, uh, I am not a medical professional, I'm not a doctor, I'm, a, I'm an actuary, I'm a statistician. Um, I work closely uh, with uh, people in those professions, but um, you know, there, are, there are limits to my expertise and, and I want to acknowledge those. Um, I think that uh, the post-viral um, cardiovascular issue is, uh, is, is well known and well studied with, uh, with other viruses. Uh, we have, um, you know, historic evidence of elevated cardiovascular risk uh, extending um, beyond um, a, uh, a an immediate uh, sort of acute infection. Um, as you say, those studies are, uh, are beginning to be produced, and of course, it's the nature of scientific studies that uh, that most of that focuses on the earlier period. So it's it's people that have had more severe infections. Uh, it's typically people that haven't had an Omicron uh, infection. Um, but we've got pretty firm evidence that uh, there are a subgroup of people who had a COVID infection who 
uh, are going to be experiencing elevated cardiovascular risks uh, for a period afterwards. So the um, you know I've seen people talking about uh, six months, twelve months uh, elevated risk. What? I mean, I'm just to push back if I may. Why in that case, if that is a driver? would the effect of it be so delayed? Because the early months of the year, we were actually seeing underweight excess deaths, and yet that period is closer to the period where lots of people had COVID. It would seem quite a strange after effect of COVID that it's sort of nothing happens to the mass population until a year later. Well, we should remember when, I think pivotal to your, uh, your questions about both vaccines and COVID infections, is we should think about when they happen. Now, the vast majority of COVID infections are Omicron infections, and they happened this year. Uh, so, uh, you know, we, we saw back in the pre-vaccine era, um, you know, we obviously we, we have case numbers, we have to estimate infections, but it's believed there were much, much uh, lower, believed with very high confidence, there were much, much smaller uh, numbers of infections actually taking place in, in 2020 and, and 2021 compared to 2022, when we've had now three very large Omicron waves. And I thought uh, we thought that the Omicron was not leading to the heart. I thought the studies were showing... evidence isn't evidence of absence. So um, we have good evidence that says that the initial wave and alpha and delta are producing this elevated cardiovascular risk because they happened further ago, uh, longer ago, and there's been more time for the studies to be done. Um, the, the fact that we don't have comparably strong evidence about Omicron infections doesn't mean that they're not doing the same thing. It just means we, we, Omicron's only been around for nine months. It's, I mean, to me, it's, it stretches plausibility a little bit because the original infections that were more serious or the original waves would have had to have less of this effect. Otherwise, it would have shown up. And then Omicron, which was much less deadly, would have had to have much greater delayed cardiovascular impact. You, you have to believe quite a few things for that to explain the shape of the charts. I think you have to believe that there were a lot more Omicron infections than uh, earlier uh, forms of the vaccine, uh, sorry, uh, than earlier variants. And, uh, you know, we, we've seen a, a, a significant multiple uh, into, because Omicron was not having uh, such severe acute uh, impacts, we have uh, allowed it to uh, be to spread far more widely, and we've seen a, a far larger proportion of the population infected. In the Nature article that I read, at least, which was talking about the link between COVID and potential cardiovascular delayed side effects, the effect was most visible for people who had actually been admitted to hospital and had a serious infection. Um, I guess that would also argue against Omicron having such a widespread effect. But at this point, we're into, we're into quite hypothetical weeds. Let me ask, as an actuary, what data set would you need to say yay or nay to this as a key driver? C can we look at national health NHS data and compare people who had COVID at particular waves with when they died and see if there's a correlation? And if we can, why has no one done that? I think it's it's quite difficult to get to the, uh, to the data. Um, so uh, we've got decent population level data. Uh, so um, you know we can look at uh, where the waves have occurred by uh, doing random samples of the population, as the ONS do and, and as React were doing. And uh, we've always been able to compare those to case numbers. And we see that um, we don't have, by any stretch, perfect ascertainment. So we're not we're not finding out about every COVID infection. And you know, to do the sort of uh, analysis that you know would be would be ideal, you'd want to know at individual level rather than population level who had what infection and when. And uh, and then you would put people into subgroups, and you'd be able to compare the the different mortality experience between groups which were identical other than the timing of their uh, infections. So, so we um, just that's, don't, that's there's no, do. we can't get it from the NHS database or anything. No, realistically, that data isn't currently available. But, um, you know, I am aware of ongoing conversations 
uh, within Department for Health and Social Care, NHS, uh, about pragmatically what can we do uh, to improve the availability of data to really start to to get fully under the skin of these questions. Because at the moment, uh, you know, as, as I hope is clear from our discussion, um, there are more questions than answers, but uh, people are doing the best they can with the data available. Okay, so let's turn to this vaccine conjecture then, for that, that's what it is. And there the thesis is that we know there are heart-related side effects of some of these vaccines and that that explains a chunk of these excess deaths, essentially. I mean, I guess, once again, there should be a data set you'd think that could quite simply compare people who've had the vaccine against people who haven't and what their mortality levels are. Have we got that data? Uh, yes. Um, Office for National Statistics uh, has, um, you know, produces good data. Uh, they don't release data on what type of vaccine people have had, but there's good data available uh, on uh, the mortality experience of people who are unvaccinated, had one or two doses, um, and uh, that data consistently shows that uh, people who have are, are fully vaccinated um, have lower mortality experience than, the, uh, than those that are unvaccinated. The vaccine has saved millions of lives worldwide and I'm sure has saved a significant number uh, in the UK. Um, it doesn't completely negate your question. The vaccine can simultaneously be reducing the risk of the vast majority and putting a small number, very small number, I would, uh, I would say, um, at, at elevated risk. And, and this is why vaccine trials take place. And, and this is why um, the vaccine has been very carefully um, monitored um, on, on its rollout. And indeed, there's been uh, changes to recommendations made about which vaccines we give to which age groups based on uh, those reporting of those uh, rare side effects. We did actually do an interview on this channel with a Danish uh, doctor and professor called Christine Stabel Ben, uh, and she did a study comparing people who had taken the different types of vaccine with overall mortality. And those results were quite controversial because it did show um, what appeared to be an increase in heart related deaths for some of the vaccines and not for other ones. I think it was the mRNA ones that were showing that. I guess unsurprisingly her study didn't get a lot of attention and was widely kind of rejected uh, for those people who did give it attention, but uh, she seemed quite convincing to me. I mean, have you looked at that data or similar data for the UK? I haven't seen that data. Um, uh, apologies, it's, uh, it's not something um, I, I, I've taken a look at. Um, and I haven't seen anything comparable in the UK uh, that would suggest uh, any elevated risk uh, for, um, for those having taken the vaccine. OK, so we've got heart conditions, potential COVID, potential vaccine. You strongly sort of believe that it's more likely at this point to be COVID aftershocks than vaccine related. What other factors should we throw in the mix here, do you think? Are there other possible explanations? Yeah, just, just one thing we didn't touch on with the vaccine, um, uh, although I, I sort of hinted at it, um, is the timing point. So uh, everything I've seen about the elevated risk to a small minority of individuals suggests that that is a very short term risk. And, you know, to, to my point earlier, we've seen an awful lot of Omicron infections um, in 2022. The vast majority of uh, vaccinations were given in 2021, so quite a long time ago. So it, it does seem to me quite implausible that uh, we saw no impact um, other than a significant fall to mortality rates when people were vaccinated. And then 12 to 18 months later, uh, we see uh, a sudden increase in, uh, in those deaths. So, you know, to me, that's another reason why I think that's quite an implausible explanation. I would also say uh, that other countries with very high, ex uh, high uh, vaccine uptake don't seem to be seeing uh, the same uh, level of excess deaths that we're seeing in the UK. I, I don't think the UK is unique in seeing excess deaths, but um, we do stand out uh, as uh, as somebody that is experiencing this uh, particularly badly. So then to turn to your question, uh, what else uh, might we consider? Um, well, I think there's two other broad areas uh, of uh, of potential concern 
Uh, one of which is the acute pressures which our NHS is currently experiencing, uh, the very significant delays that people are experiencing uh, when they phone for an ambulance or when they present themselves to an accident in the emergency department. So that would be uh, one thesis. And I, I think actually uh, that would be the strongest um, hypothesis for, for what we're experiencing at the moment. Can we just dwell on that other... one for a, a moment, course. Stuart? Because um, that is an interesting thesis. And uh, John Byrne Murdoch at the Financial Times is, is quite convinced of that one. He produced a chart where his sort of projected excess deaths that he would expect, given the additional waiting times in A&E, and given what we know about how every two hours increases your chance of dying for certain conditions, did seem to roughly match the excess deaths shape that we've seen. So he, he's quite convinced that there's a, a link there. And I suppose, in defense of that thesis, the fact that there is elevated excess deaths along so many different conditions, from you know diabetes through to, what were the other ones? Cardiovascular. So cardiovascular conditions, cerebrovascular, diabetes, urinary. Uh, most causes, really, other than uh, cancer and dementia, uh, you know, those sort of... Uh, old age uh, type um, frailty, uh, you know, they're, they're, yeah, most of those acute causes seem seem elevated. So would they, that then would be explained by just a sort of hospital system that isn't working as it should be and is working less well than it has in years past? Yes, it's, it's certainly um, a creaking under the strains at the moment. Um, we are seeing on various different uh, measures um, signals that uh, would support this uh, this this thesis that um, uh, the excess deaths are, are related to these strains. So, for example, um, if you have a stroke or a heart attack, and these are both things that would fit into those um, sort of cardiovascular, cerebrovascular um, causes that we've called out as being elevated, um, the target for an ambulance response time is 18 minutes. Uh, in July, which is the last data that uh, is available, uh, they were taking 59 minutes. Now, I'm no medic, but uh, everything I know about strokes and heart attacks is that what happens in the first 15 to 20 minutes is all important. It's taking nearly an hour uh, to get an ambulance to uh, people on those Category 2 calls, then sadly there will be more deaths. So potentially then, we have to look at whether it matches timing-wise, I suppose. It is it true that the period over the past summer that has had the most consistent excess deaths matches the period of, kind of worst performance for things like waiting times and emerge A and E sections? Do we know that that's a correlation? Um, yes, you can see an association uh, as per that chart. Um, the, the way I would describe it is um, that the NHS is, is currently experiencing winter pressures in summer. 93% of uh, hospital beds, uh, urgent and emergency care beds are occupied. Now, the, the, the NHS can't work in the way a, a factory might with a sort of just-in-time philosophy where you run at 99% capacity. You need a considerable capacity of, of uh, empty beds available so that patients can be rotated to be given the care that they need. Let's turn if we could, to the last of your potential factors here. Um, I didn't let you finish it, but um, I'm wondering if you're going to mention lockdowns. Well, I'm going to mention um, missed and delayed diagnoses uh, from earlier in the pandemic. And so uh, at that, early on, uh, a, a lot of people, as we talked about in the context of cancer care, but it's also very relevant for, for other cares, um, the, the pandemic arrived, people's behaviour changed. Initially, uh, it changed voluntarily. Uh, later, uh, we were, uh, the, the government took a decision to uh, impose a lockdown. Um, and, and that lockdown, whilst in most cases, it didn't prevent people from seeking care legally, um, uh, there was a behaviour change. Uh, people were choosing to avoid a perceived risk of, uh, of COVID. And um, we've seen waiting lists grow. Uh, we've seen, uh, n particularly for elective non-urgent care, uh, waiting lists are up by more than 50% since before the pandemic, with 
around 6.7 million people now on those waiting lists. Um, additional to that, uh, it's believed that there's a, a large uh, hidden need, if you like, of people who perhaps ought to have come forward for care. If they'd had uh, statistics, multi-year statistics tell us that we expect a certain number of people to come forward with concerns, uh, you know, about lumps that they want investigated or, um, you know, other things that are worrying them. And, and a lot of those numbers fell and fell substantially, particularly during uh, that first lockdown. So, Although, um, Stuart, would you not think that if that was the, a major driver, it would disproportionately affect older people, you would expect to see cancer up there uh, uh, in the kind of excess death list. And we're not really seeing that. I mean, w tell us about the age distribution. I haven't really asked about that, but it seems like such an important factor to consider. Where are these excess deaths coming from in the age spectrum? So at the moment, uh, you know, over that kind of 10 year period, 10 week period uh, that we talked about earlier, um, excess deaths are, are reasonably proportionate across adult ages. Um, so um, obviously the majority are at older ages, uh, if you look at it in, in counts terms, because that's where most people die. Um, but uh, excess deaths are, are kind of elevated by broadly a consistent amount uh, across the age spectrum and uh, the, across the adult age spectrum. And um, what about children? Uh, so the I, I don't have numbers to hand on that, but obviously the number of, of child deaths uh, while all are tragic, um, it, it's very small and it, it, it won't, if you'll pardon the phrase, it won't move the dial on the sort of general population numbers uh, that, that we're talking about here. So among the, among the age bands of adults, you're, you're not seeing younger age bands disproportionately increased compared to the oldest? At a slightly earlier stage in the pandemic, um, uh, we, we were seeing uh, more of an excess amongst uh, young adults. Um, the last time I looked at it, uh, you know, looking at this this specific concern where um, the the excess has been significantly elevated uh, in the last few months, uh, I, I was actually seeing elevated really across the age spectrum, which was suggesting that um, you know it, it it may well be uh, something which is affecting people proportionally. So because um, what you, you see, know, it's, a, a lot of supports the demand. People are, are focusing on this idea that young, fit sports people, athletes, actors, celebrities keep keeling over. This has become something of a kind of big tabloid story. I don't have, obviously, uh, to hand full data sets of, of how many young people should be keeling over with no previous conditions. It look, feels like a lot from the news, but it may just be that we're paying more attention to it. What's your analysis of that? These stories of uh, you know, young, fit sports people are always eye grabbing. Uh, this is something that uh, is a consistent issue uh, when uh, looking at, uh, at, at mortality, at longevity. Um, it's it's all an, an unexpected death is um, far more uh, memorable, kind of a visceral memory than um, you know people living longer than expected, and and you know which was obviously the reality uh, of, of of the last couple of hundred years, uh, uh, you know, sort of outside the, the pandemic period was, was people living longer and it being uh, less easy to bring those examples to mind. So um, the, yeah, a, a young and unexplained death is tragic. It, it grabs our attention, um, but I'm not seeing evidence that um, these are disproportionate to the elevated risks that we're seeing uh, amongst older age groups. And uh, I don't think there's anything that allows us to sort of clearly identify um, the, the cause. OK, let me give a final question to you, which is more of a sort of overall summary. Do you feel confident enough to rule out vaccines as a contributing factor to this excess death data? Or are you just saying from what you've seen so far, you are unconvinced? From what I have seen so far, I am firmly unconvinced. Uh, there is nothing um, from the medical uh, literature. Uh, as I say, I'm not a, a medic, um, but from, from what I've read and from experts I've spoken to, there is nothing there suggesting to me that they would be um, explaining 
a meaningful proportion of this, this large excess that we're seeing. Um, there is nothing in the data. Um, there is, um, yeah, I, I, I am firmly of the view that uh, they, are, uh, they are not the explanation. Um, can I 100% prove it with the data that's currently available to me? No, but uh, there, there are so many stronger hypotheses than that one. Um, I, I think that's getting undue focus amongst uh, a group who have allowed themselves to um, become, you know, th th that have gone down a rabbit hole, I would say, of, of um, that, that's allowed them to become more and more worried and, um, and clutch onto irrational theories. Stuart, thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. That was Stuart MacDonald, an actuary and demographer for Lloyds Bank. Not someone you would think has an axe to grind, especially on this question. Someone who is sincerely interested in the reality. His business depends on it. Taking a view and going through the data with me on what these excess deaths might be caused by. No doubt there will be people watching who feel we missed out. Certain factors didn't give enough emphasis to certain piece of evidence and by all means send them in uh, put them in the comments down uh, underneath this video or email them through to unheard we will look at them with interest for now it's fair to say that we haven't got as he said at the end a hundred percent answer on this but there are good reasons to think that the current hospital situation where people are not being seen properly and not being seen quick enough looks like it might be a significant, possibly the significant factor in explaining these. Of course, there's a whole other argument about why we have this hospital problem, and some people will put that down to COVID measures or Brexit or all sorts of other things. Let's have that argument on another day. Thanks for tuning in. This was Unheard.